Hi, I'm Tom Hart from the Sequential Artist Workshop, where we teach graphic novels and comics here in sunny Gainesville, Florida. This episode, Composing a Page. These days, designing a page can mean anything. It can mean designing for a computer screen, it can mean designing for a standard comic book, it can mean designing for a newspaper, maybe enormous, harkening back to the old days. Maybe it means designing for one of these things. Or maybe you've got dreams of some sort of crazy construction like John Chad's amazing object here, which is designed to look like it's traveling through the earth all the way from one pole to the other. Whatever your final goal, either way it means you've got a finite amount of space, probably a finite amount of space. You've got a finite amount of space, and you've got to use that space to tell your story. You could use a grid system like Ivan Brunetti's here, where every panel is exactly the same size and carries the same weight. You can start to stretch those panels lengthwise and heightwise a little, so it becomes a sort of puzzle on the page. You can turn it into a sort of diagram like Chris Ware does here. You can make the entire page a single panel, or you could be a lot more freeform like Mickey Z. In short, there's a huge variety of ways to approach designing the page or the screen or whatever you're calling. Let's look at some examples. Here's two great pages from Jeff Smith's Bone. Real simple, what I want you to see here, as the chase scene is happening, the characters are running away from a swarm of locusts. You're looking at all horizontal, wide panels. Suddenly, when the ground gives out, what you're seeing is falling, all long, tall, vertical panels. Now, it's nothing new, Here's Lionel Feiniger almost 100 years ago doing the exact same thing. The characters are going up, up, up in this air balloon. Long vertical panels tell that story. This cat is chasing these birds up the, to the top of the balloon, pops the balloon, and as they're falling, parachutes, dresses, pajamas, hats, whatever, helping their way down. You're still looking at tall, tall panels. Finally, you get that expansive ocean. It gives way to a big, wide, horizontal panel. All of these panels are the right size and shape to tell the story that needs to be told. Another quick look from that same era, Windsor McKay's Little Nemo in Slumberland. Here, Nemo's having a dream, and this dream, this tuba in this parade is growing larger and larger, this enormous tangle, so that each tier, each row of panels has to grow wider and wider to accommodate the tuba, so that by the last row, the tuba is basically one enormous tangle of brass and whatever, and it needs this long, single panel to accommodate it. In this example by Will Eisner, the gunfighter, we've got wide panels and we've got tall panels. Ma, give me a nickel. What for? The merry-go-round man is coming. So what's going on is, yeah, things are being tossed down and those are in the tall panels. And when the kid runs off to the truck, that's in the wide panels. But more than that, the world of the children is short. The world of the children is the long horizontal panel, a long wide world with street level. The world of the adults, tall panels, but also narrow. Suddenly there's this differentiation. It's not just about the action inside, but it's about the worlds inside. This is a big topic. We'll look at more in part two.